Welcome back to the Exhorter Podcast, where we aim to stir up love and good works through bite-sized biblical discussion. This episode is part two on exhortation with a focus on why we need exhortation and why we need to be exhorted. We'll also give you a practical tool to help you do this. So stay tuned for that. Why is it that we need to be exhorted? Well, it sounds like the the devotional that we just had, you know, it was it was called Light the Fire. But a big focus of that was reminding us of the enthusiasm and the love that we should be having on a regular basis. But why do we need to be reminded of that? Maybe that's the question. Because mankind is stupid. (laughs) (laughs) That is a profound, that might be a quote for the podcast right there that we we've solved it right there. Um, Why is it that we need to be exhorted? Why do we need to be reminded of things? Why, we had a, the devotional we had was to, to, to renew our minds, our theme for the year, to refocus on God. But why, after we've been saved, after all that God has done for us, do we need to be reminded again and again? I'd like to say it's because we're human and, you know, Jesus had to do that to his disciples like every five minutes. Saying, Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what my purpose is? Right. Um, and so I'd like to say that it was just because we're you're human, just like everyone else has always been. But um, I think it's because diligence is exhausting. You know, that's what it takes you know, to not be distracted and to not be complacent. It takes diligence. And um, I just think that we don't live in a certain way in this nation or in our own lives that centers everything around God and focuses everything on him so that it's always at the forefront of what we're, we're, our choices and our mindsets are. We, we put God in a very specific box on the weekends and then, and before meals and, you know, different areas in our life. And I just think that, uh, unless we were to, um, integrate, I guess would be the right way him into, all aspects or kind of reverse engineer our lives so that he is at the true center of everything. Uh, I think we're always going to have to exhort ourselves and and others um, because we're human. When I think about why I need exhortation and why I struggle to keep God at the forefront of my life every day, I think in terms of the parable of the sower in the, in the soil, and I often ask myself, what kind of soil am I? And the one that, that I regret to say that I identify with the most easily, the seed that is scattered among the weeds, among the thorns, where the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches and the desires of other things entering in choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. And I think that's a problem for many today. Uh, we live in a very prosperous country. And so it is easy to become entangled by this world and to become complacent and just kind of drift through life without really feeling the need to be devoted to God. So as far as practical application is concerned, what what does this look like to you guys? What does it look like? How do we accomplish stirring up love and good works in in the lives of our brothers and sisters in Christ, uh, in in the lives of our fellow Christians? How do we provoke this response? We read in the Bible, Uh, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 23 talks about whoever rebukes a man will afterward find more favor than he who flatters with his tongue. One of the things that we probably don't do enough, and I'll say, especially as men, is confess our sins, hold each other accountable for the things that we're doing, which means sometimes I need to hear from someone where I need to be better. And we're so polite But as Christians, we need to be holding each other accountable. And sometimes that means hard conversations in love. Right, right. And that's where we get to some of the more strongly worded ideas of exhortation, the the spurring on as I, I know you can do better or I know that you know better. And so we do need to have that idea that sometimes exhortation comes in the form of a difficult conversation or confronting someone about sinful behavior. And that is very important. Uh, Something John alluded to earlier is, is the idea of building relationships, that if we're going to have an impact in somebody's life, if we're going to hope to exhort them, we need to know them. We need to have a relationship. They need to trust us and know that our motivation is because we love them, especially in those situations where we might have to rebuke or have some strong words. That will that won't have any impact if they don't understand that that we're coming from a motivation of 
love and what's in their best interest. You know, in Acts chapter two, uh, at the day of Pentecost, after thousands were baptized on that first day, it says in verse 45, uh, verse 46. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart. It tells us that early Christians, they enjoyed each other's company. It was beyond just assembling once on Sunday. It was, I guess what I'm saying is you got to have deeper conversations than just Sunday after worship. How are you doing? I'm fine. How are you doing? I'm fine. Everyone says they're fine, but you have to dig a little deeper than that sometimes. And that means contacting people outside of Sunday. That means having them in your house for a meal. That's when you really get to know people. So Kyle, you know, that's a good, a great comment. Let me ask a question that might take that a little more practical for us. The, at the church in Clovis, you know, we've got a good number there. And sometimes you could say with so many people, how do you put that into practice? So we talk to each other in the aisles. Uh, Sometimes we may only see people on one side of the church building. How do you put that into practice? Is it, maybe it's going to coffee. What, what, What do you do? The five minute rule. The first five minutes after worship is done, talk to somebody that either you have not met. So prioritize visitors. Look for someone that you don't know and you go to them and introduce yourself. If you don't see visitors or someone that you don't recognize, then look for someone that you haven't talked with. Because we we all do this. We all have maybe those at church that we're a little closer to than others and the, the people that we tend to talk with more frequently than other people at church. Maybe it's because you have kids the same age as each other or you're the same age in life or you have a lot of shared experiences. I get that. That's why I say the first five minutes prioritize. Find someone that you are less familiar with and go strike up a conversation. That That's one thing I would suggest is, is the five minute rule. It kind of goes back, John, to what you were saying, though. If you if you haven't built a relationship, it's difficult to exhort. Um, I remember a time years ago calling someone who had not been at church for a long time and had been struggling and that person had, had fallen away. And I did reach that person and I will never forget what she said to me. She said, people are reaching out to me now, but they never talked to me when I was at church. And, and that really hit me that, wait a minute, something's wrong here. If that's the case, we need to build those relationships to really be impactful in exhorting to show, you know, we care about other, each other all the time, but you've got to have a relationship with your brethren to really do that effectively member of our congregation, Nate, he, he told me the other day that he, one of his goals for the month was to have more scriptural based conversations in the month. He encouraged me by, by just the simple thought about saying it right. And then in making it an intention, I, I can talk to Kyle for like 18 hours about the next film or the next, you know, or why the last Jedi is a horrible abomination to all sure, Star Wars fans. That, that topic um, can be of 18 hours, but um, but I actually feel so much more... Um, well, those conversations are enjoyable. They're of little value. Right. So I feel so much more encouragement and I, I have, like walk away from conversations where we have literally debated something from the Bible or we've or we, I've had my mind challenged about a scripture. Um, it gets so much more gratification about that. And I, I don't think you get to some of those conversations when you go to coffee or you talk to people, you don't always get to those until you take that moment to say, I'm going to try, I'm going to bring up something that I've been thinking about. If, if my mind is wrapped around God's word, and if I am focused on that, uh, it will naturally come for me. I think this desire to encourage even my own family. Another just quick story of a real practical application years ago when I was dating Londa and uh, she was in Florida and she was moving out to California uh, her last Sunday at her congregation in Florida, the one of the elders said that he wanted to speak to us afterwards. And I don't know why, but I had an ominous feeling like this can't be good. An elder wants to speak to us. It must be something bad. So I was nervous the whole service. What is it going to be about? It, it, does he have some problem with me? Is there some issue? And I, I don't know why I was just really nervous. And so we went in there and I was waiting for some something bad. And he came up and he said, I just want to pray with you guys about some things before you leave. And I would say that there was some exhortation in that prayer, but it was some some of the most impactful, meaningful and loving exhortation that I'll never forget. 
you know, just remembering how he did that and the, the impact of him praying right there, right then with us meant something. And that can be a good question to ask somebody if we want deeper conversations on Sunday afternoon than just, how are you doing? Uh, Nice weather this week. Maybe a good question to ask, how can I pray for you this week? In what way might you need prayers? How can I be of help to you in prayer? Uh, That might be a good question to ask. Prayer is a very useful tool for uh, encouragement and exhortation. I think what impacted me, Kyle, was so often we say, I'll pray for you. And we, we may do that at home. But it was meaningful that sometimes, is there anything wrong with taking that person aside and saying, how about we just pray right here, right now, and let's do it together? Paul, it's funny you mentioned that story because uh, I think over the last, um, I don't know, 15 years I've known you plus, uh, I, I I know I've heard that story two or three times, times oh, okay. from you, at least two or three times, but um, it's it's been multiple times in the context of you stopping to pray with me when I had hardships in my life or a parent was in the hospital or something like this. And I have to say that you're hearing the story of why you were doing it yourself and then um, and then actually going through that. I mean, it, it was awkward at first, this idea, but it didn't take much much more than like five or six seconds into it where I'm like, what is this? Wait, wait, you mean you can just do this? You can just, you know, sit and pray with someone and make them feel listened and loved and encouraged and uh it, it was it's a it's an amazing feeling that you can give to people um but yeah i, I appreciate you sharing that because uh, you've used that on me a couple times in my life and uh, i've been i'm really benefited from it now another simple application of exhortation is giving compliments because we focused on a lot of the more strongly worded ideas of spurring on or provoking but there's also some translations that have that expression a little more soft like we ought to be concerned about one another in order to promote love and good works or to stimulate one another to love and good deeds and i think giving people compliments is a very positive way to reinforce the kind of changes we want to see in their life that if they're doing something good we want to cultivate them to keep doing that when it's a a young man who leads a prayer for the first time or or perhaps gives a a brief devotional talk want to go up and, and give him a pat on the back and say that was that was excellent we want to see more of that good job or if somebody does something for you of course you want to be grateful and and express your gratitude but uh giving people compliments it's something how many times have you thought about Oh, I wish I'd have said something to him. We'll do it. When people do something good, call attention to it. Compliment them on that. That's the positive reinforcement side of exhortation. So a very simple idea that often gets overlooked. Give people compliments. I'm going to read the passage you wrote down, Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. You know, we we can use our words to tear people down so easily. We need to be careful about that and always be aware of, of the power of our words and, and let that reflect that, that text in Ephesians 4. Only words that build up, only words that, well, we know this from our youth. If you can't say something nice, then don't say anything at all. Yeah, Stumper, right? Stumper? Yeah, Stumper. yeah. yeah. Yeah, if I spot a visitor when I walk in, I'm like the Terminator. They're marked. I'm catching them before they leave. Nice. And what you say to them is what? You will be back? Or what what do you say? Yeah, please be back. Thanks for listening to this episode. I hope the five-minute rule helps you develop stronger relationships in the body of Christ. If you found it encouraging, I hope you'll share it with your friends. 